Death, the final enemy. I named this series that because of 1 Corinthians 15, 26 that says, the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. And tonight we want to study the scriptures together as we ask and answer the question, do you understand the seven deaths of the Bible? And so let me invite you to open your Bibles with me to the very first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, and the second chapter in that book of beginnings, Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. In the book, Death Around the World, we're told of some of the strange rites and weird customs which sometimes accompany dying. It's an account of how people attempt to deal with this whole issue of death. And in days past, many families were buried on their own land, perhaps in sight of the house where they had lived. In many European lands, the early cemeteries were located near churches in what was called consecrated ground. On the other hand, wicked men were sometimes buried at crossroads so their spirits, quote, would become confused if they attempted to return to the living. On some occasions, a stake might be pounded through the heart of a corpse, thus nailing it to its grave, they thought, forever. As folks were afraid of, of spirits or banshees, Associated with funerals and customs were things such as the traditional Irish wake. It was like a sending off party for the deceased. When someone died, clocks were stopped and mirrors and pictures were covered and the corpse was put in the parlor and coins were placed on its eyelids. And as the deceased lay in state, friends would come by and pay compliments to him. And wakes often were noisy affairs because they were accompanied by heavy drinking. Does it surprise you among the Irish? It was considered improper even to weep before the funeral. You've all heard that you can't take it with you, but the inhabitants of Ur in the Chaldees tried to. The graves of Ur's notable residents included Along with them, their slaves, their pets, their musical instruments, and their personal treasures. One queen was buried with her carriage, gold drinking cups, and slaves. The same was also true in Egypt, even as we think of King Tut and, and his tomb and the things that were contained therein were things they believed would be helpful or things they wanted to have with them in the afterlife. In Babylon, children were taught that the dead, through seven gates, would go into a dark, terrible place called the land of no return. The Greeks believed that the souls of the dead were rowed across the river Styx on a ferry by a boatman named Charon. But since it was not a free ride, a coin was placed inside each corpse's mouth before burial. When Marco Polo returned from China, he told of an old Chinese belief in life after death, saying that they held that as soon as a man died, his soul entered into another body, going from a good one to a better, or from a bad to a worse, according to how he had conducted himself. We know that today to be called reincarnation. Well, death in the Middle Ages was pictured as a grinning skeleton who carried a um, scythe which uh, was cut down his unsuspecting victims as the grim reaper. And it may surprise you to learn that across the world, most people are not buried in caskets. Many who live in distant countries cannot afford this luxury. So a simple bag is often used and sometimes not even in that. Embalming is another case in point. Seldom is a body buried in England these days as often cemeteries are too full to allow additional burials. And there can be a lengthy waiting period. And as a result, most bodies are 
are cremated instead. Though practiced in ancient Egypt, in America, the custom of embalming didn't take hold until after the war, namely the Civil War. In fact, for hundreds of years, outlawed, uh, countries outlawed the practice of cremation as a heathen custom. And the first cremation noted in the United States took place in 1782 when Henry Lorena, or Lawrence, I should say, requested it in his will. Cremation was considered an honor among the Vikings, and it was usually reserved for heroes or, or chieftains. And with the bodies of his favorite horses on board, the king was placed on a ship, and then the ship was set on fire and pushed into the sea. People of the ancient world were afraid of death and the unknown which followed, so they wanted to make sure the body was completely destroyed. Now, in, in India, a custom called sati was practiced in which widows were burned to death on their husband's funeral pyres. And in the year 1829, finally a law was passed abolishing this terrible Hindu rite, largely due to the influence of English missionaries like William Carey. The Egyptians believed so strongly in life after death that those who could afford it were mummified in an effort to preserve the body. And not only were they mummified, but oftentimes they would mummify their cats because they really liked their cats. So they wanted to make sure Kitty came along with them into the next life. Anubis, a, a jackal god, was considered guardian of the tombs there in Egypt. And the priest in charge of mummification wore a fearsome mask which represented Anubis. And embalming took many days. And so the pharaohs wanted to go out in style and thousands of slaves actually died while erecting their memorials. And while the burial customs and traditions vary from people group to people group, one thing remains absolutely constant. Life is short, death is certain, and eternity is long. And that's why I'm so grateful, again, to have a copy of the written word of God, the Bible, to be able to see what God has to say on this issue. What is death? What happens after death? Is there a heaven? Is there a hell? Must we be afraid to die? How do we cope at a time like this? Should we, how do we view burials? How do we view cremation? How do we view a number of things? You know, I, I want to assure you that in this series on death, the final enemy, we will see from the word of God answers to all of those questions and many more. For in the scriptures, we have the timeless counsel of God's infallible and inerrant last word on the subject of death. By way of review, we began, oh no, that's why in Job 14.14, 14, the question was raised, if a man dies, shall he live again? And God, in his word, says... Yes. By way of review, we began our study last Sunday by considering this, the certainty of death and how it's clear it's appointed unto man once to die and after this the judgment and that life is short and God has many ways of communicating this truth about death. In fact, death is mentioned over 1,300 times in the Bible. We then looked at the cause of death, and we noted that the general cause of death is the effects of sin. In fact, Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death. And that the specific cause of spiritual and physical death in the human race is Adam's sin and the curse. As you turn to Genesis chapter 2, we begin now in verse... Seven. In verse 7. 
In Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, as we get the details of what transpired in chapter 1, we read, And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Man became a living soul, or a human being, a living being. Now, tonight in liturgical churches who are usually denominational in nature and traditional and ritualistic and such, there is the beginning of what is called Lent. Now, Lent is not found in the Bible. It has nothing to do with the Bible. It's imposed upon the Bible. And the, what kicks off Lent is what's called Ash Wednesday. And it's taken from Genesis 3, where dust thou art and dust thou shalt return. And I remember, with my Roman Catholic tradition, going up on Ash Wednesday, and the priest would take his thumb, put it in the ashes, and put it on my forehead. And again, you weren't supposed to wash it off. It somehow was supposed to just fall off, kind of like my hair. And, uh, you know, and they had this ritual. Now we see in Genesis 2, verse 7, that the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground. What part of man is that? It's the body, right? And breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. That's his human spirit. And man became a living being. A living being. King James used to have a living soul. You see, we see an immaterial part of man here and a material part of man. Now, this is the original creation. And through procreation, we have transferred now the body of one person to the other, as it were, through physical birth. And God still imparts a human soul to that individual. And I am of the conviction that one becomes a person with personality and a soul at conception. For example, Isaiah 50, or Psalm 51, 5 says, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. And me is a personal pronoun. One was conceived as a person at that moment of conception. So we see there's this physical part of man and this this immaterial part of man. And they both play a part when it comes to death. Now in Genesis chapter 2, we see God placed Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And in verse 16, the Lord God commanded the man saying of every tree of the garden, you may freely eat, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. God was very generous, very gracious, put this man and woman in a garden setting, says you can eat everything here, one prohibition, don't eat the tree in the middle of the garden. And by the way, you know, a lot of times you see the picture that it was an apple tree, it doesn't say it was an apple tree. And as I've said before, the problem was not the fruit in the tree, the problem was the pear on the ground. You know, Adam and Eve was the problem. We don't even know what the tree looked like. What we do know is this, that God did not want a robot who would, yes, I will serve you. But he gave man a volition in which he could choose to respond to the Lord or not, because that is what really constitutes the value of a loving relationship, is when it's not forced, it's free and chosen. And thus God gave Adam and Eve a choice to make, but we knew there was a consequence for the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. Now, Hebrew scholars tell us that this literally means dying, you shall die. Dying spiritually, you shall die physically. Because again, there's a material and immaterial part of, of man. Now, as we go to Romans chapter 5 in the New Testament, and we pick up again the New Testament interpretation of what transpired due to Adam's sin, as again, the Bible is the best interpreter of itself, and here is the commentary it makes. 
We read in Romans chapter 5 and verse 12, Therefore, just as through one man, namely Adam, sin entered the world. And what is the result of sin? Death through sin. And thus death spread to all men because all sinned. And thus as we think of man, man is a threefold sinner. He is a sinner by imputation. Adam's sin was put to his account. He is a he is a sinner due to inheriting a sin nature. And thirdly, people choose to sin. And so we got imputed sin, inherent sin, individual sin. And three strikes and you are out. And thus a just and holy God would have every right to judge and condemn those who have violated his will and broken his laws and are worthy of this sentence of death. And so death is an issue we must all face. But secondly, it is a word we must all understand. Let's define our terms. What does death mean in the Bible? And the first thing we note is that the word death in the scriptures never carries the idea of non-existence. Of non-existence. When you think of death, don't think there's no existence. That's not it. Instead, the word death in the scriptures always carries with it the idea of separation. And this is critical to note, and we will see this throughout various passages tonight. Not non-existence, but separation. In fact, as we think of even the key Greek words for death, and there are three basic words. The first is thanatos, that's the Greek form, thanatu the verb form, and it means to put to death. It's used in reference to the separation of the soul from the body, the separation of man from God, and it never denotes non-existence as Vine's expository dictionary of New Testament words. The second Greek word is the word nekros, or nekro, the dead in contrast to the living, and it's used of the death of the body. It's used of the spiritual condition of the unsaved. There isn't a lot of difference between thanatos and necros that I can see from the scriptures. The third word is the word anaresis, is the noun, or anairo, the verb. And it speaks of the taking of a life or the putting to death, to kill or to slay. It's used in Acts chapter 8, verse 1, regarding the murder of Stephen. Now, as we look at Thanatos and Necros tonight primarily, context will mean a lot as to what a word means. And we do that in our own um, language as well, don't we? As I've said before, if you say to someone, go and get the trunk, unless you know the context of trunk, you don't know are you talking about the back of a car, a box in the attic, The snout of an elephant, what are you talking about? What does trunk mean? You know, I've said before that one of the uh, ongoing um, pieces of humor in my marriage is my wife will pick up a conversation from three hours earlier and jump back in without any context or notice. And I will say, honey, what's the context? Now, I've noticed that other women, they're able to do this. It's incredible. They'll just pick up something they were talking about before, three hours later, and pick up, never missed a beat, and they'll know exactly what they're talking about. And I'm like, "Uh, honey, I don't know what you're talking about. What are you talking about? Well, you know what we were talking about three hours ago, you know. Oh, yeah, of course. How could I ever have missed that, you know? But when it comes to any verse in the Bible, any word, in the scriptures and such, you always have to look at its context. And the same is true with this word called death. And in doing so, I believe that you can arrive at a proper biblical conclusion that there are at least seven kinds of death recorded for us in the Bible. Now, the first one is what we would call physical death. Now, there may be different ways of describing these deaths, But these are the terminology that we have chosen to use and that many others have as well. There is physical death. 
Now go back with me, if you would, to Genesis chapter 35. Very interesting verse here. By the way, is it warm in here? Okay, can we cool it off somehow? Genesis chapter 35. You know, I was, uh, I've been listening to the Bible on CD this year. The dramatized version, very enjoyable. I'm in the car, I'll listen. And, and, and I listen sometimes to the same CD, which covers usually, oh, I don't know, 12 chapters. I might listen to it two or three times, just taking it in, thinking about it. And I was listening to this, this section on, on Jacob and Rachel and such in Genesis 35, and I was struck in Genesis 35 with verse 18. And so it was as her, namely Rachel's soul, was departing, for she died, that she called his name Ben-Onai, but his father called him Benjamin. Now notice here, as her soul was departing, she died. What happens at physical death? And that's what this is describing. What happens at physical death is there is a departing, a separation between one's soul, the immaterial part of them, and their body, the material part of them. Now this is reinforced in James chapter 2, verse 26, for it says, as the body without or apart from, the spirit is what? Dead. It's separated. And in this context, it's speaking of physical death. The body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Remember, when God breathed into the nostrils of Adam the breath of life, he became a living being. So once the breath of life or that spirit departs, you are dead. You're dead. Now go with me, if you would, to Philippians chapter 1. Now for a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, one who has staked their eternal destiny on the truthfulness of God's word by putting their faith in the Son of God who became a man and who died on the cross for one's sins and rose again to get him to heaven. And such was true with the Apostle Paul. He had been a religious Pharisee. He had hunted down Christians. He had blasphemed the name of Jesus Christ. And though he had, in one sense, more religion per square foot than anyone who ever walked the face of the earth, on the other hand, he called himself later on the chief of sinners. Now, it is an amazing miracle when anyone gets saved, but it's doubly miraculous when a religious person gets saved. Because the more religious a person is, the more they prone to have self-righteousness and pride and to think that somehow they can get their good works to outweigh their sins. And thus, if anyone should go to heaven, they should go. And no wonder God puts at the top of the list of sins he hates pride, because it's through pride that people reject Jesus Christ and God's plan of salvation by grace. And that was true with Saul of Tarsus until the day that he met Jesus Christ, the resurrected Christ, on the Damascus Road in Acts chapter 9. And he was saved by the grace of God. He was then transformed, as it were, into the Apostle Paul. And the great persecutor of Christianity became the great defender of Christianity as an amazing tribute to what the grace of God can do. And in Philippians, he finds himself in a prison cell because of his preaching of the gospel of Christ. But instead of being down, he's encouraged. He realizes all things are still working together for good. He recognizes that regardless of his circumstances or the responses of anyone else, he could still be what God would have him to be and do what God would have him to do because our Christian life depends on no one else. Ultimately, it depends totally on the Lord. And what God is looking for from us is a willingness to trust him day by day, just like we trusted Christ for our salvation. 
And so having divine viewpoint on the launching pad of his thinking, he is able to look at this circumstance different than a carnal believer would. And instead of praying, get me out of this mess now, instead he wanted the Lord to be glorified in the mess, whether he lived or died. Now that is a different way of looking at something. That is not how we normally look. Now, in Philippians chapter 1, we see this very thing mentioned in verse 20. Paul says, according to my earnest expectation and hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. In other words, Paul is saying here, listen, the bottom line for me in my Christian life is I just want Christ to be magnified. I want him to be honored. I want him to be glorified. Why? Because he saved me by his grace. And I now yield to him as my Lord. And I now desire to have my life honor him with whatever years of life he gives me. And in doing so, I want him to be magnified right in my body, the external you that the internal you lives in, whether it's by life, continuing to live, or by death. Was he afraid to die? Not at all. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Now that is how God wants us to think. That if you have been saved by God's grace, he's left you on this planet not to fill space and take up air. He's saved you in order to use you to bring honor and glory to him, to mature you as a believer, to enjoy fellowship with you, and allow him to work in you and through you to accomplish what he wants for his honor and glory, for he is deserving of it. And thus, if we're thinking right when we wake up every day, we realize that my life today belongs to the Lord. I've been bought with the price. It's not about me. It's about him. And my desire should be in cooperation with the Spirit of God's objective is to live for Jesus Christ instead of me. And if you die as a believer, guess what? It's gain. Why is it gain? Because you're going to go to be with the Lord. That's why. Now, frankly... For to me to live as Christ and die as gain makes no sense on any level apart from the word Christ in there. For to me to live is to get married and to die means I didn't quite get there. For to me to live as my kids and to die means I'm going to be separated from them. For to me to live is my job and to die means someone else takes my job. For to me to live is the state hockey tournament. And to die means I miss it. Doesn't make any sense. But when you're saved by the grace of God, you can have an eternal perspective. In fact, until you're prepared to die, you're not really prepared to live. And as a byproduct of knowing Christ, you can be thinking in terms of, for to me to live is Jesus Christ. I just want him to be honored today. I want him to be magnified today in whatever I'm doing. Learning to live my life as unto him. And should I die, that's just going to be gain because I'm going to go home to be with the Lord. You know, I can't help but think of Lydia Erb, and I'll use her throughout this series a little bit, in that she recently died. Here she was saved as a, as a country schoolgirl, as it were, there in Wisconsin through some traveling evangelists back in the 1930s, and as a byproduct, spent years of her life serving the Lord, giving out the gospel, putting on vacation Bible schools, and in fact, in her records, just dating from 1974, not before, that she has the name of at least 20,000 kids that she gave the gospel to. Now, if you knew Mrs. Zerb, she was not this outgoing, assuming kind of person at all. In fact, she could be here tonight, and you would never know she was here. And yet she was faithful to what the Lord called her to do. She learned how to walk with the Lord. She spent time in the Word of God. She meditated on Scripture. She prayed. She lived very simply and very humbly. And her life traumatic was greatly used to impact many people for Jesus Christ. For Lydia to die is gain. And you know, she was looking so forward to doing it. Apparently she was taking notes before she died in her diary. She mentioned how the chest pains were increasing and such. But at 93, she was ready to go. And to go she did. And to die is gain. 
Now notice Paul says, but if I live on in the flesh, this human body, this will mean fruit for my labor. In other words, if I'm living for Jesus Christ and being controlled by the Spirit of God, there's going to be fruit from my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I cannot tell, for I am hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to, what? Depart. Depart from what? The body. And to be with Christ. Can you have that kind of assurance? Can you know for sure if you die, you are going to be with Christ? Paul says yes, and it wasn't because of how he was living. It was because of who he had trusted, namely the Lord Jesus Christ. And to be with Christ is, now please note these words, far better. For every believer etched on every casket should be far better. On every headstone of every grave should be sketched far better. Far better. Why would we live for the things down here when we've got something to look forward to? Far better. Far better than anything here. That's why every tear that really is wept when the loss of a loved one isn't for that loved one. They're far better if they're saved. It's wept for us in a sense that we will miss them. There will be a sense of loss. And that's not inappropriate, but as a believer, we sorrow not as those that have no hope. Because we know that they're with the Lord and we know that one day we are going to see them again. Far better. You mean far better than the ladies' retreat? Far better. You mean far better than the state hockey tournament? Far better. You mean far better than going to Florida or Mexico or somewhere else during break? Far better. In fact, all those things are Mickey Mouse in light of the bigger picture. Nevertheless, he says, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. Now I want you to notice, here we got Christ, here we have Christ, here we have you. Again, what's joy? Jesus, others, and, and you. This is one of the reasons why you don't have joy in your life. Even if you're saved, because if unless the Lord is first, and as a byproduct you're willing to minister to others, when you put the why right up here, we've got Yaj. So we've got we've got Yaj. I can see you got a lot of Yaj in your life tonight, huh? Yaj. Yeah, because it's all about you again. It's all out of order. And what happens when it's all out of order and the Lord is in first? Pretty soon you start investing in all the wrong things. Instead of investing in what matters in light of eternity, you start to just totally invest in what matters in time. Instead of investing again in the Lord and then in your marriage and then in your kids and lastly in your career, pretty soon you start investing in your career and you shortchange your marriage or you shortchange your kids or whatever and pretty soon you're justifying it because we want to live on a certain lifestyle style and as a byproduct then when it's all said and done what do you really have when it's all said how many people do you know again when they die they want sketch on their headstone i needed to spend more time at work they don't you will never regret living for jesus christ as a believer and letting your life count you will regret a failure to do so and so we see, first of all here, there is physical death. For the believer, we need not be afraid of that, for to die is far better. But secondly, there is spiritual death. And to see this, go with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Now in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, it says, And you he made alive who were, here's our word, dead in trespasses and sins. Now obviously they were physically alive, but they were spiritually dead. But notice the word were, past tense. Now they are alive spiritually. He's writing to physically alive people who were spiritually dead, but now are spiritually alive. 
And that's true of everyone before they are saved. They are physically alive but spiritually dead. And by being spiritually dead, death means separation. They were separated from spiritual life because they were separated from God in which you once walked according to the course of this world. The world squeezed you into its mold, and that's where you found purpose and happiness. According to the prince of the power of the air, that's Satan, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature, now catch this, children of wrath, just as us. You know, when someone's born into this world, they are born a sinner. They are born separated from God. They are born a rebel, a congenital rebel. And they are a child of wrath, not a child of God. That's why we need to be born again. Don't believe the lie, we're all the children of God. That's not true. If that's true, why would you ever need to be born again? Why would you need to become spiritually alive? And thus Satan has perpetuated that lie through religion and other means in order to rob people of the sense of need and urgency to be born again because they already think they're a child of God through physical birth or maybe through infant baptism, which is nothing better than a bad bath. So we see here spiritually dead. We see sons of disobedience. Children of wrath, three strikes against us. We are out. And unless God does something for us, we have no hope. And don't you love how verse 4 begins? But God. But God. God did something about it. God, and now watch these superlatives. God who is rich in mercy... Because of his great love, with which he loved us. Now notice past tense, he loved us. Does he keep loving us? Yes. But what is this pointing to? He loved us for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Even when we were dead, dead what? Spiritually, in trespasses. He's made us alive spiritually, together with Christ, identification, How did this happen? By grace, you have been saved. God giving you something you don't deserve, and he gave it to you in gift form. And he's raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Do you realize that what will transpire in the future is that God will put on display believers who have been saved by his grace as a means of awing, as it were, the angels and the universe. I mean, just think about it. Here's someone who is spiritually dead. He's unable to save himself. He's got three strikes against him. He has imputed inherent and individual sin. All his righteousness are his filthy rags. He has no hope. Religion is a facade that gives them a false sense of some security, but never anything absolutely guaranteed. But God is rich in mercy. He has great love. He makes us alive together with Christ. He saves us by his grace. He puts us into Christ, and he puts us on display. And God is going to put on display Dennis Roxer. He's going to put on display you if you've been saved. And and the angels are going to say, wow, awesome. You know why? Because angels have never been shown grace. When they chose to rebel against God, the third of the angels, they've never been provided salvation. Only you have and I have. Well, why? Because God chose to do it that way, and I'm glad he did. And then Paul summarizes here in verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Grace saved faith. Faith in who? Jesus Christ. And that salvation is not of yourself. That salvation is the gift of God. And that salvation is not of works, lest anyone should boast. And thus, I put this up and I noticed after that it was in Spanish. But the word here means holy God. God is holy and the the 
barrier of sin. El hombre is, we've got man here. And we realize that sinful man and holy God, there is a barrier of sin that separates us. And God in his holiness has to judge sin. On the other hand, man tries to break that barrier down through various religious works, and the Bible says you're saved not of works, lest anyone should boast. And that's why we rejoice tonight in the Lord Jesus Christ, the unique God-man, the one who came to earth and died on the cross, and when he died, he paid for our sins, past, present, and future, bar none. And he had you in mind and me in mind. And on that cross, he cried out, it is finished. And all sin for all time, for all people, were fully paid for by our substitute, the Lord Jesus Christ. But I want you to realize that when he died, to make full payment of the penalty of sin, since you shall surely die, dying spiritually, you shall die physically. That when Christ died, he died both spiritually and physically in order to take care of it all. The penalty for sin is death spiritually and physically. So on that cross, what did he cry out? Matthew 27, 46. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you what? Forsaken me. Why have you separated yourself from me? But the penalty for sin is death, and death is separation. My God, my God. It could be there for emphasis. Most believe, or many believe, it's in reference one to the Father, the other to the Holy Spirit. Why have you forsaken or separated yourself from me? Now, this was no cry by chance. This was a fulfillment of Psalm 22. Because in Psalm 22, David begins by saying, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is a messianic psalm predicting what Christ would say on the cross. In fact, in Psalm 22, 16, it was predicted that he would be crucified. And that was written 700 to 1,000 years, actually about 1,000 years, before Jesus Christ even came. And it's a rhetorical question because Christ knows fully well why he had been forsaken. In fact, the night of his betrayal in the garden, remember of Gethsemane, he said three times, let this cup pass from me. What cup? The cup of suffering in which he would drink, as it were, spiritual death. And he would experience something he had never experienced from eternity. He would experience a separation of fellowship from the Father and from the Spirit. And since the penalty for sin is death, to pay that penalty, he would have to die spiritually. And that's exactly what he did. And he was forsaken. Why? Because God is holy. And holiness demands a penalty for sin. But the good news is that when he died, he died as our substitute. Isaiah 53, 700 years before Christ came, records he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord laid on him, namely the Lord Jesus Christ, the iniquity of who? Of us all. Substitution. Now, again, being raised Roman Catholic, I oftentimes would attend church services this time of year and doing so see the stations of the cross. And I could see physical suffering and physical beating and physical spitting and physical scourging and physical and physical and physical. And I knew before I would say that Christ died on the cross supposedly for our sins and rose again. What I did not understand is this truth right here. The substitutionary sacrifice of Christ. I did not really know why he died. Why did he have to die? Because the penalty for sin is death. Death is separation. And thus, to bear the equivalent of hell for me, he would have to die and be separated spiritually from the Father and the Spirit. And that's exactly what he did. And he did it for me. 
And that is why Isaiah 53 says in verse 10, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his, now catch this, soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed and he shall prolong his day. Why? Because he not only died, but he is resurrected. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. So in on that cross, nearly 2,000 years ago, when darkness covered the face of the earth and Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? God the Father had put on his Son your sin and mine. He was dying spiritually to pay the penalty for our sin. And then Hebrews tells us that by that will, we've been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifice, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. So on that cross, Christ died spiritually and he died physically. His soul was made in offerings for sin, and his body was also made an offering for sin to make full payment for our sins, for dying you shall die. And thus Colossians 2.13 says, and you being dead spiritually in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. And why could God forgive you all trespasses? Because when you put your faith in Christ, who died for all of your sins, forgiveness for all sin, past, present, and even future, became yours. And so there is, is physical death. Secondly, there is spiritual death. And Christ died both physically and spiritually, so you could avoid the third. There is eternal death. Eternal death. If you go to Revelation chapter 20, Revelation chapter 20, which about three or four Wednesday nights ago we were hunkered down on this passage. We read, beginning in verse 11, these words. And I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. And the sea gave up the dead who were in, and in the death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now notice, this is the second death. What is the second death? Being cast into the lake of fire. And anyone not found written in the book of life and every person's name who's there have been saved by God's grace was cast into the lake of fire. But when you're saved by God's grace, absent from the bodies, present with the Lord, those who are being judged here are the unsaved, and they're judged according to their works because they pit their works against Christ's work, and having their day in court, it'll be found that their works could never save them, and thus they are appropriately and justly and righteously cast into the lake of fire because they failed to accept God's only way of salvation by grace alone through faith alone in the Lord Jesus Christ alone. This is eternal death. The fourth kind of death we see in Scripture is what we would call positional death. Positional death. If you go with me to the book of Romans, chapter 6, and we've been here recently, so I'm going to breeze through this point as well. Romans chapter 6. We see this amazing truth of our position our union, our identification with the Lord Jesus Christ is being the very reason why after we're saved, 
that we should not live in sin. Verse 1, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Now notice here, here's the word death. And it says we died to sin. And again, the word sin has the definite article in it in the Greek, the sin nature. And what does death mean again? Separation. So on some level, in some way, after we were saved, we now are separated from the sin nature. Yes, it's still in us. Yes, it still wants to run us. But it legally has no right to do so now. And we as a byproduct can actually live a life that honors the Lord. Well, how do we die to sin? Verse 3, or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk now in newness of life. Notice, died, death, and death. You see, in a very real way in the mind of God, and therefore something we should accept by faith, that though we were in Adam, now we are in Christ, and in doing so we have died to sin, We've died with Christ on that cross. We've been crucified with him. And we've been raised as a new creation in him to walk in a different way than before we were saved. This is positional death. The problem is that though we have died to sin and we're alive to God in Christ positionally, we don't always practically appropriate that. We don't always practically walk in the spirit. We don't practically walk in fellowship with the Lord. Too often we yield to our sin nature. We, we cave into the world. We live by sight. We indulge our flesh. And when that happens, we experience a, a fifth kind of death, which we call temporal death. Temporal death. By that we're talking about the fact that though we're saved, and we're part of the family of God now, that we're, when we walk out of fellowship with God through sin, we live in a state of temporal death. Now go with me, if you would, to Luke chapter 15 for a moment. Luke 15. Now here's the story of the prodigal son. While many characterize this as teaching salvation, I think it's better understood of teaching the grace of God to ungodly sinners, including saved ones, who break fellowship with him. We pick it up in verse 11. Then he, Jesus Christ, said, a certain man had two sons. Please note, they're both sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them, both his older and younger son, his livelihood. In other words, he gave them his, their inheritance in advance. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. In other words, he wasn't the goody two-shoes. He was just the opposite. He was the black sheep of the family. He indulged his flesh. He went and let it rip in prodigal living. He was thinking that's where happiness will be found, out of all the dead-end streets of life. Verse 14, But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. The money finally ran out, you know, the uh, jingle jangle ceased. Verse 15, then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, some Gentile, and he sent him into the fee fields to feed swine, which have been absolutely abhorrent to a Jew. Now let me just comment here. That any Jew in his right mind would never be involved in feeding swine. But you see, when a believer is carnal, when they're operating out of the flesh, when they're not in fellowship with the Lord, when they're not thinking divine viewpoint and they're living for the things of the world, instead, they are capable of anything in the catalog of sin, and oftentimes they will sink lower than unbelievers will. 
And unbelievers will even look at them and say, I thought they were a Christian. Look at what they're doing. Can't believe it. Now, I realize this isn't what God wants. God wants us to walk in newness of life. But it's also indicative of the fact that apart from the grace of God, we can make a real mess out of our lives as believers. And just because we're on our way to heaven doesn't mean we're going to serve him in time, though that option is available to us and is by far the best option. And you know, you can either take this by faith or you can learn it through the school of hard knocks or just the tuition is far more expensive than the latter. He begins, he begins to get in want. Verse 16, and he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate. No one gave him anything. I mean, he was ready to eat the pig's food. Now that's amazing because here, as a believer, he could be sitting feasting at his father's table. That's why when you walk out of fellowship and you stay out of fellowship from the Lord, you are wasting your life. You are a miserable person. And even though you may try to hide that misery by, again, you know, turning to drugs or alcohol or sex or something else, you are an absolute miserable person. And that's this man right here. And you will sink low, oftentimes. But you know, some believers have a tremendous tolerance for misery. Verse 17. But when he came to himself, and I love, this is the turning point of the story. Came to himself. You know, sometimes as parents, they have prodigal children that go astray, you know, in their college years or whatever. And they're thinking, oh, oh, Lord, I, I think they came to the end of themselves there. And I think, oh, no. They didn't hit bottom. They went straight through. Maybe now they'll turn to the Lord. Oh, no. And you know what? As a parent, you can't really do anything but pray for them. Point them to the Lord. You can warn them at times. You can try to encourage them. But ultimately, they've got to taste and see the Lord is good. They've got to come to the conviction that Christ is worth living for. They've got to, in a sense, begin to hate their chains instead of hugging them. Verse 17, but when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare, let alone the sons of my father? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and I'm going to go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you and I'm no more worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. And when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. I mean, that is so touching to me. The father was waiting for him to come home. The father wanted his fellowship. You know, God wants your fellowship and privileges you with that opportunity every day. But what did the son need? Did he need to believe in the Lord? No, he needed to confess that he had been wrong. And that's what he does. For you see, when we get out of fellowship with the Lord, confession of sin is in place. We need to just admit it. In fact, ideally, keep very short accounts with the Lord. But you know, sometimes when believers go prodigal, they don't even know where to begin. Am I supposed to confess my sin? I don't even know where. I mean, I've done so many, so often, for so long, I want to know where to begin. I'll die by the time I figure it out. And the Lord is so gracious and says, I'm looking more for an attitude than I'm looking for the specifics. Will you admit you've been wrong for the purpose of coming back home, as it were, and putting yourself under the Lord and let him run your life? Well, no, I don't want to do that. Well, you're not getting anywhere with that. Keep gagging on the world, because that's what you'll do. Just gag on the world. 
And you'll pour yourself into money. You'll pour yourself into your job. You're going to think that, you know, getting married is the answer. And guess what? When you're out of fellowship, I don't care what you've got going for you. You're still going to be a miserable, wretched person on the inside. For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and peace. And that's not going to be there when you're not walking with the Lord. You're just self-deceived. So the Father's there. Meets him, greets him, kisses him repeatedly. And by the way, he hasn't confessed yet, has he? Because you see, God never quit loving him. The Father never quit loving him. And when we're out of fellowship, the Father never quits loving us either. Now, in this state of temporal death or out of fellowship, he does divinely discipline us. Whom the Lord loves, he does discipline And sometimes he may intervene in a special way. Sometimes he just lets you gag on it. You know, it's like, again, the kid who wanted to eat a pound of butter and his dad just said, go ahead. I know of a believer who's had a 14-year-old son who wanted to chew snuff. So the dad got him some snuff and said, here, here's some, and here's some more, and here's some more. And the guy got a big wad in his thing, and the kid was chewing. He goes, how is it good? And all of a sudden his dad hits him on the back. Ooh. Swallowed it. He's over on the side, just puking his guts out in a few minutes. Well, enough snuff. <laughs> that problem's over. Let's move on, you know. Probably will never do that again. Verse 21, And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. I have ruined your testimony. I have ruined your reputation. I, 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 I. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry for this my son was, here's our word, Dead. He's alive again. He was lost. He lost his way. He's found, and they began to be merry. And remember, one of the byproducts of walking in fellowship with the Lord is what? Joy. Joy. My son was dead. In what sense? Did he stop being a son? No. Had he died in the pig pen, he would have died a son. Because the doctrine of eternal security teaches that when you're truly saved, you're saved forever. You can never lose that salvation. You can lose your fellowship, but never that salvation. He would have died a son in the pig pen. He died a son. He could have died out of fellowship with the Lord, but he died as a, or he lived as a son back at the Father's house. And now he's finally admitting and saying, Lord, we're going to do it your way. And pretty soon they're sitting down having fellowship. And by the way, you notice the first thing they did wasn't, oh, by the way, you've been gone for a long time. Get busy and start making up for what you've missed. No, let's just start having fellowship. Because out of that fellowship will flow service. That's why, again, unlike a legalistic church, when someone gets saved here or someone you know, has been saved and not a fellowship and they come back, we don't say, oh, let's make them a deacon. That way we can hold them, you know. Or give them a position of some kind. No, instead just come out and hear the word of God. Start to learn to enjoy fellowship with the Lord again. And the rest will take place. Now if you go to 1 Timothy chapter 5, I'm going to point out temporal death one more time here. Uh, maybe not one more, two more. 1 Timothy chapter 5. Paul is addressing widows, verse 5. Now she who is really a widow and left alone trusts in God continues in supplications and prayers night and day. But she who lives in pleasure is dead while she lives. She's dead while she lives. She's dead. Now she's talking to Christians here. She's dead while she lives. Now in what sense is she dead? Is she physically dead? No. Is she spiritually dead? No. She's spiritually alive. Is she eternally dead in the lake of fire? No. Is she positionally dead? Well, yes, but that's not the context clearly. She is temporarily dead. She's out of fellowship with the Lord because she's just living, indulging her flesh. She's dead while she lives. Now go with me to James chapter 1. 
James chapter 1. In James chapter 1, James says the same thing. In verse 13, he says... Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. By the way, is he writing to a believer or unbeliever here? A believer, how do we know? Beloved brethren. It's right into a believer. And so he makes a distinction between being tempted here, tempted, and sin. To be tempted is not sin. Temptation yielded to is sin. And sin, when it's finished, brings forth death. In the context, he's writing to believers. So what kind of death is this? Is it physical death? I don't believe so in the context. Spiritual death can't be. Eternal death, no possibility. Positional death, that's not what he's talking about. This is a negative thing, not a good thing. He's talking about here temporal death. Out of fellowship with the Lord. And when you're out of fellowship with the Lord, there are byproducts to that, which leads us to death number six. We're just calling it, for the sake of a term, operational death. Operational death. And while we're in James, let's go to James chapter 2. In a passage that is misunderstood by most, even Bible teachers, I believe, normally misinterpret this passage. In fact, when you explain to someone you're saved by grace and it's just through faith, it's not uncommon for them to say, well, faith without works is dead. And what they usually mean is faith isn't enough. Faith is not alone. You've got to have works as well. Now, in verse 14, what do we read? What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? Can faith save him? Now, I want you to notice a few key words. My brethren, is he talking to a believer or unbeliever? Believers. Is he questioning whether they're saved? No. Next key word, profit. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works, can faith save him? Now remember, the word save here in the book of James is used of second tense salvation. He's not talking about first tense being saved from the penalty of sin or hell. He's talking to believers. He's talking about salvation from the power of sin in your life and its damaging effect so that you do not live a fruitful life for the Lord. Now, can you illustrate this, James? Yes. If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Now, what does it in reference to? What does... It, your faith, profit. How does your faith benefit anyone else if it doesn't have works that can help someone? Thus also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But what does dead always mean? Separated. Does it mean non-existent? No. And I say that because, again, there are those in the lordship camp who would teach that if you truly have faith, you will have works. If you do not have works, you don't have faith. And therefore, they say faith is dead means equals no faith. But the word dead never means non-existent. It always means separated. To have a dead faith, how can you have something that's dead that doesn't exist? And thus, it's faith by itself. When someone says, well, faith alone saves, but genuine faith is never alone, first of all, that's an oxymoron. But two, it just tells you faith by itself is separated. Separated from what? Separated from benefiting someone else. That's the context here. It's not profiting anyone else. And then he goes on. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me 
your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my work. Can you demonstrate your faith to anyone else apart from something like your works? But notice, show me, not God. God knows whether you have faith or not, and God knows whether you're walking by faith or not, but you cannot be a testimony to anyone else in a true sense apart from a faith that manifests itself in helpful works. You believe there's one God, you do well, even the demons believe and tremble. But why, why, by the way, the demons don't have, quote, saving faith, which I, I don't even like using the term because faith doesn't save you, Christ saves you. And saving faith isn't a special kind of faith. It's just the normal kind of faith in the right kind of object. But do you want to know, O oh foolish man, that faith without works is, is dead, separated. And in this context, not profitable now catch this. To others. To others. Say, can you illustrate this? Yes, I'll give you two. Verse 21, was not Abraham. Here's illustration one. Our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son upon the altar. By the way, Abraham was justified by faith. It was declared in Genesis 15, 16. He was justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar. Years later. Do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works, faith was made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God. It was counted unto him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see that, that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Question, justified by works before who? In this context, before others. Show me your faith apart from your work, and I will show you my faith by my works. In other words, people will not declare you righteous as a righteous person apart from a faith that has works that are profitable to others. Now, Paul clarifies this in Romans 4, 1 through 3. What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not, now please note this, before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God it was counted unto for righteousness. James is talking about being declared righteous before man. Paul is talking about being declared righteous before God. To be righteous before God, it's faith alone in Christ alone. To be righteous before men, it's faith in the Lord manifested itself then in works that benefit others. So faith without works is dead in the sense of operational death. Your faith doesn't find manifestation, demonstration, benefit, profit to others. And that's the case. Now this leads us to the seventh death, our last one tonight. There, there is sexual death. Sexual death. You say, well, isn't there Viagra today in Cialis? Well, the illustration that's used in Romans 4 is Abraham and Sarah, who had a child. She was almost 90. He was almost 100. I mean, can you imagine reading the paper? Instead of the obituary, you read the birth announcement? Abraham and Sarah, 90 and 100, just gave birth to Isaac. You say, that's clearly a misprint. No, no. Verse 19 says, And not being weak in faith, Romans 4, 19, he did not consider his own body already dead. sexually, since he was about 100 years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. She was not merely post-menopausal. She was post-post-post-menopausal. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. In other words, God is the one who gave them this child in an amazing demonstration of supernatural ability. 
By the way, you know that after Sarah died, that Abraham remarried and had about five more children. That's just incredible. When God fixes the plumbing, he really fixes it. So we have seen tonight seven different kinds of death. There is physical death, there is spiritual death, there is eternal death, there is positional death, there is temporal death, there is operational death, there is sexual death. But in every case, it carries the idea of what? Se separation. Now, what does all of this mean to you? Well, it depends. If you are a believer in Christ, you've already been crucified with him. You've been raised with him to walk by faith in the power of the Spirit in a brand new kind of way. Are you enjoying that tonight? Or are you living in temporal death as a believer? And are you living your life in a way in which you have a testimony for Jesus Christ, a life that's a reflection of what you believe? Or would people say, if people, if someone got saved and came out to church here and they saw you, would they be blown away that you were saved? because they've worked with you or they've listened to you talk or they've had to function with you in some way in which they would say, man, I never thought he was a believer. And if that's true, that's a shame. Because Jesus Christ saved you by his grace and now wants to deliver you. Now I know God is gracious. And frankly, if you're here tonight and you hadn't, you know, you've had major blowouts in your life, but you're here to hear the word of God, I commend you. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But it's also true that God has given us a solution, and we need to appropriate these things. But if you're here tonight and you've never been saved, Jesus Christ died for your sins and rose again to give you salvation as a gift. And he's offering it to you tonight. And while the wages of sin is death, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And thus one day when you physically die, if you are spiritually alive, you will enter the very presence of God in heaven saved by grace. But if the opposite is true, when you physically die, you still are spiritually dead, you then will be separated from God and ultimately cast into the lake of fire because you never accepted the only Savior God ever provided. And you can do that tonight by putting your trust in him. Let's pray. Father, thank you again that your word, rightly divided, makes total and perfect sense. May we not thrust our theology upon it, but may we draw from your word sound doctrine, healthy doctrine, that will, again, clarify your perspective in one issue after another after another. May we just love the word of God. May our hearts rejoice to hear it, and by your grace, we believe it increasingly and learn of it and grow in it, and may it find obedience in our life as a byproduct. And Father, thank you that Jesus Christ tasted death for everyone so that we could have spiritual life in him. For he that has the Son, we know, has life. And he who does not have the Son does not have life. These things you have written to us who believe on the name of the Son of God that we may know beyond the shadow of a doubt, that we have right now eternal life. If anyone is here tonight and does not know for sure they've been saved, may tonight be the night they believe it for themselves and receive the gift of salvation, we pray. Thank you so much in Jesus' name.
I want you to pray for the ladies' retreat, again, Gary Nelson's dad's funeral. I invite you to join us Sunday. By the way, Sunday morning, the Lord willing, we'll continue this series. And we're going to answer the question, why do Christians die? And what purpose does God have in our deaths? So I hope you can join us then. Again, thank you for coming tonight. You're, the young people will be out in just a few minutes from their practice. In the meantime, stay free, feel free to fellowship, though we do need to take down the gym tonight. Thanks so much. You're dismissed.